Hi, everybody. So here we are at the American Fine Arts Foundry with Brett Barney, owner. And we are going to see the process of our Sam Winston bust being cast into bronze. Thanks for coming down today, Davis. And uh, hopefully this will be educational for your crew and you can see what we're doing here. Yeah, this is going to be pretty exciting. I mean, it kind of falls outside of the, of the realm of special effects, which is primarily what Sam Winston School is all about. But I think it's going to be fun to see a piece cast in bronze. And there are a lot of artists uh, like myself and a lot of others who kind of live in both worlds, the special effects world and the fine arts world. Um, so this would be a cool peek into that, kind of going through the, to the other side of the mirror. Yeah. Well, what we're going to hope to show you today is there's about 10 steps that, take, uh, uh, that occur in the lost wax foundry process. And so my goal today is to take you from beginning to end and show you all those steps that happen. Some are dynamic, some are static, um, but hopefully through all of it you'll get a good perspective on how much work it actually takes from trained artisans in each of their specialties in each of their departments to realize uh, your sculpture that you've put all your heart and soul into and bring it all the way through to the final product. And you know, our goal is to be not the weakest link in your process, but at least on par with the artists themselves. So hopefully that comes through in the final piece. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it really will resonate with people who do special effects because they are all just the craftsmen behind the scenes and they don't you know, ever get the glory or the credit uh, that they often deserve. The fine art world is exactly the same way. You know, the, there's the artist who uh, you know, gets to stand next to the piece at the gallery, and, or, um, but there's a whole army of, of people, whether in the bronze world or the marble sculpting world or everything else, that does all the actual technical processes, and uh, they're kind of unsung heroes, just like special effects artists. So it's, uh, it'll, I'm excited to see this. And my first thing uh, as an artist was an apprentice in a foundry and I haven't been around it since, so it's gonna be exciting. Well, welcome home. <laughs>I'm going to take you through right now is the steps that it, it, uh, it goes through in the Lost Wax Foundry process to take a, a, an initial sculpture by the artist, such as Davis, what we usually receive here, and then how we take that and we apply our process and take it from raw materials all the way through to a cast bronze. Um, the first thing that happens, and I know you guys have already taken care of this, but uh, in most cases we have to mold the piece. Um, mm -hmm. And that means that typically what we receive here at the foundry is an original sculpture. It's made either in uh, clay, wax, wood, any material, it could be stone, uh, that an artist likes to work in. The next step is to make the mold. I think you've covered that well. Uh, after we have a mold, we go over to our wax department. And the process of making a lost wax casting, which ultimately becomes a bronze, is much like making a chocolate Easter bunny. Uh, we want a hollow shell because it would make the bronze solid creates two problems. One, it would be very costly, but two, uh, you have a lot of casting defects that can occur when you're managing the heat in the process. And so what we strive for is a, a casting wall of about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. So what the first thing is that we do is we have to take the mold and we actually make a hollow wax, which is now a positive image of that negative that you uh, created with the mold. And so it's going to look hopefully just like the original sculpture that you've done. And uh, once we have that wax, we're gonna be, uh, take it out of the mold, crack the mold open, get the wax out. The next step is then to uh, do what we call wax chase. Now, whenever you pour a wax, it comes out of a mold, there has to be parting lines on the mold, so we have to remove any of the seam lines that have occurred just in making the wax itself. Sure. Plus, if there's any air bubbles that ended up in the wax, anything like that, we go back and we, and we call it perfecting the wax. And in, our, in the special effects industry, uh, the kind of the term is seaming, or what you would call chasing, they tend to call seaming, or fab the fabrication department will then take a piece, uh, in your case it's wax, in our case it would be you know, fiberglass or foam latex or anything, and the seams would be cleaned up and any bubbles filled in in this probably okay. very similar way. I'm sure it's very similar. So uh, seaming or chasing, we go back through and we, we clean that wax up. The next thing that we have to do is we have to sort of engineer uh, how that piece is going to get cast and how the metal is going to flow into the shell uh, throughout the piece when we pour the bronze down the, down the process. So what we do, is it's called gating, uh, and we design the channels for the flow of the bronze in and the escaping of the air out of the temporary mold that's going to be used for casting the bronze. Uh, we then have to put a coating of a ceramic material. Um, uh, we call it the shelling process. When you shell the material onto it, it's a multi-day process because you have to essentially dip it in a slurry solution, which makes the piece wet. 
and then we apply a coat of a, of a special type of sand to it and we repeat that process about eight times. In the beginning part of the process, we're using a very fine powder. It's actually called flour. And that has such a fine texture to it that it's able to recreate and capture all of the detail that you put into your sculpture. Mm -hmm. Then as we get the, uh, the detail captured, we then move forward with larger and larger crystal sizes in the sand, and that begins to build strength. And so that takes about two weeks to just get through that part of the process. So everybody always asks me, why does it take so long? Well, right. it's like watching paint dry in some yeah. parts of it, because you just have to let the process take care of itself. And essentially, it's a second mold. You have your original mold from your sculpture, which is usually a silicone mold, so you can get a wax out. And once you have your waxes, you're essentially making a second mold, like a rigid mold made of ceramic. Correct. The way we call it, we, we take the, uh, the original mold that came right off the original sculpture, we call that the master mold or the mother mold. Mm -hmm. uh, the mold that we use and that we create out of the ceramic material is essentially, it's a, it's a waste mold. It's a one time that's going to get destroyed in the process. Great. So once we have the shell, uh, we then move into what we call the burnout phase. Um, we, uh, we cut off the bottom of the ceramic, we turn it over, and we heat it. And what happens is as that uh, shell is brought up to temperature, a couple hundred degrees, all that wax then just melts right back out. And that wax is captured and then recycled back to our suppliers. So once we have now an empty shell, no wax in it, except maybe a little residue, we put it back into an oven. We bring it back up to, uh, or not back up to, we take it up to temperature for the first time, about 1,500 degrees. And at 1,500 degrees, it burns off any of the excess wax that's in that shell, and it vitrifies the material. And vitrification is the process of taking uh, a silicon-based sand and turning it into a ceramic, pro uh, ceramic material, and it's basically making it into like glass. Mm. And what that does for us is it gives us a very brittle but very stiff and strong material that we can then pour the bronze, and it'll take the pressure that happens when you pour that molten heavy bronze into the shell. Sure. I mean, it's again, uh, we're essentially dealing with the same processes uh, generally of sculpture and casting uh, and applying them here into the bronze world, but similar kind of uh, general processes and kind of chemical concepts of heat and heating things apply also in the special effects world where we heat up the ceramic to vitrify it, and vitrification. Vitrification. Uh, and then the same thing would happen with foam latex where it's heated up for vulcanization, right? So okay. the heating process changes the, uh, the physical properties of the substance. Okay, cool. cool. You're teaching yeah. me a lot here today. <laughs> Once we have that, uh, that piece in shell and it's ready for casting, the next thing we're going to do is you, typically the next day, we'll reheat it back up to casting temperature, which is about 1,500 degrees for the shell. Uh, once that's at 1,500 degrees, we're at the same time we're bringing the bronze up to temperature, which is approximately 2,000 degrees. And then the crew uh, will work together to pull the shells out of the oven, line them up for the pour sequence, which is all predetermined, and then they pour off all the shells. And they have to do that as quickly as they can because uh, that bronze is cooling, the shells are cooling, but the reason that the shells are hot is so that uh, the bronze, as it enters and flows through there, you don't want it to just cold stop. You want to get a good, even pour through the, through the entire shell so that you get a great casting. And for us, the whole process of foundry uh, is about managing heat. Uh, we don't want too much heat, we don't want too little heat, and so that's kind of the art that goes into the process here, and especially with casting art, because every piece is unique. Right, yeah, uh, and to continue the, the comparison, uh, with the, like when people are pouring foam latex, again, it's a big hurry. The pour somehow always seems like a big, scary, <laughs> run around hurry. But uh, the same thing, the, it's not cooling, but it's gelling. And, but it's the same thing. As it gels, the flow decreases. And, uh, and so we're seeing all the one-to-one -one corollaries. You know, if you're a special effects artist, everything you learn in the special effects world can be applied to the fine arts world and vice versa, and people can jump worlds, which is this, what this is all about. Yeah, it's interesting because there are Parts of the process, they're like watching paint dry. You stand around, you wait. You yeah. know, it takes multiple days, but then there's other parts that happen like that. So. Sure, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, definitely working in a shop or working in a fine arts studio. It's uh, it's a lot of hurry up and wait, and a lot of real horrible boredom, and then it's punctuated by moments of panic. Yeah. <laughs> well put, well yeah. put. Okay, so uh, now that we've got the piece um, brought up to temperature, we've poured the metal, uh, the next thing that we do is we let that shell cool down with the molten bronze in it. 
as the piece cools, the uh, pressure from the shrinking and cooling bronze begins to splinter or shatter that ceramic material that we use to make the shell. And it begins to slough off. Uh, and then whatever's not naturally coming off by itself will, uh, will, will knock it off with uh, a hammer just a little bit to just break it. Uh, we then take the piece and we bead blast it with glass beads and we get off any remaining shell material, clean it up, uh, and get it ready for the next step in the process, which is what we call metal chase. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a corollary for that in your process. Um, I or guess not. It, it's uh, what the funny thing is that there's there's always it seems in the in the bronze world there's a, a re repetition of steps. There's a casting of wax and the chasing of the wax out of a mold, and then another mold, which is the ceramic shell, and then a casting of the bronze, and then again a second chasing or seaming step. Mm -hmm. So I mean it's it's just kind of a, a repeat of the, the seaming step that you do with the wax but this time in the metal. Yeah, okay. Or, vers or like us doing a fiberglass or a urethane or a foam latex piece. Again, it's just cleaning up all the seams and any imperfections. Okay. Well, once we have the piece cast uh, and it's in the metal department ready for metal chase, uh, there's two things that really happen in there. Uh, the first is if the piece had to be segmented for mold making, or just to uh, manage the casting process, we then reassemble all those parts back together. Mm -hmm. And in the metal chase, we've really got to be able to get the textures and the assembly back to what the artist approves. And so our guys um, typically, uh, our average back there is 23 years of experience in this industry. So this is something they've committed their life to and they're very good at. And uh, what we get paid for is to accurately reproduce all your texture and all your detail to the best that's possible. All the welds that have to go into the piece and any imperfections that happen in the casting process all have to be eliminated. And you've got to look at the piece and go, that's it. So yeah. at the end of the day, that's what we got to get to. Yeah, I mean, all, all of their handiwork has to be completely invisible. Uh, and to get the vision of the artist done, for, you know, basically from what he intended originally, all, uh, as if there was no intervening steps. And it was just kind of his vision completely. Which, again, is just like the effects world where all that hard work you do is completely invisible, right? No one really knows what you did. There's crews of hundreds of people and they all, and every step they make, they're not trying to put their signature on it like these guys aren't, right? Their, their pride comes from uh, almost being invisible. And you know, the more invisible they are, the, the better they did their job. Great. So uh, once the piece is uh, finished out in metal, uh, typically in our process, the artist comes in and approves the metal. Now this thing has been through a number of processes so far within our foundry, and um, the artist has to make sure that everything from that point has been completed to their expectation. Mm -hmm. And once that's good to go, uh, the piece is uh, brought out to our patina department, where we then work with the artist to put the coloring on it that they have envisioned from the beginning. Um, and the patina process is done as a, uh, it's a heat process, which is the catalyst, which drives an oxidation, typically done by salts or acids. So different salts, different acids will give you different color effects, and the patina artist or the patineur has to have a good understanding of the solution strength for those materials, the heat that's required to get different effects, uh, the layering that might have to happen um, in order to drive different colors or different kinds of uh, shadings or, or um, luminosity through the patina. And so, I don't know if there's a corollary for that in your process. But oh yeah, there absolutely is, really. But I guess the term patina is where we get our term paint from, right? It's just uh, a surface coloration. Uh, whereas we actually use paints, you know, an airbrush and you know, latex paints and silicone-based paints. Now you're actually doing a, a chemical process that indelibly causes the material itself to take on a color as opposed to applying a color. But it's, it's essentially this, the paint process in a sculpture. Yeah. The true patina, the patination, is done with that process that uh, changes the molecular structure of the surface of the, patina, of, the, of the bronze. We do apply paints, we use pigments, we use all the same tools, airbrushes, right. um, we do a lot of different kinds of sprays, we do things with waxes. So for us, we have a lot of options on how we can colorize. Right. Uh, typically more contemporary artwork is using a combination of patina and pigments and dyes, whereas more of the classical work that we do uh, tends to follow classical process, and so right. then it's much more of your classic browns and your verde greens and yeah. some of those kinds of colors that we're used to seeing, or you know, a, a statue you might see in Central Park, for example. Yeah, it's absolutely. either been fully oxidized by the natural elements, or um, it's just been done by hand with an intention mm. on the color that they wanted. We found that most artists uh, think monochromatically because they're working with a material that's monochrome, whether it's mm. clay or wax, and oftentimes they get to the end of the process and they go, 
I don't know. I don't know what color should it be. Right. You know, so we find ourselves kind of in that advisor or, or almost sometimes sure. therapy session kind of right. <laughs> step to help them figure out what should yeah. be the, fa the maybe the primary color and then any kind of transitional mm -hmm. effects that they want to do in the piece. Well, in the effects world, typically uh, the designs are done, color, you know, a million color tests and a million variations. So they tend to know uh, kind of ahead of time what the finished piece is going to look before the piece even starts. Uh, but still, in the end, it's the same. It's the same thing. We're uh, applying colors to something, and the color, just like you know, in in special effects and in sculpture, the actual colors that you use can enhance or really detract from a piece. If Absolutely. it gets, if your uh, patinas get too busy, uh, it can really detract from all the detail of the sculpture. Or a really great patina can sometimes make a not so great sculpture look a lot better. That's absolutely true. And I think the last step we have that you may not have in your process is we have to mount the piece. And so typically that's on a stone or wood base. Uh, sometimes it's got a pedestal or a stem that holds it up. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's whatever they want to mount it on. Sure. Sometimes they're freestanding, but yeah. that's kind of, that wraps it up. So here we are, back where we started. Yeah, it's been a long process. Uh, but it's been really great for you to show us this whole process from beginning to end. It's been really exciting to watch. Uh, this is actually the first piece I'm having cast in bronze of my own. And uh, it's been really amazing to watch this happen. Uh, and it's also been great for the, for the students to see how these skills, as we repeated throughout this process, how it applies uh, to, to special effects work and to fine artwork. Artwork is artwork, and the craft is always the craft. And creating three-dimensional objects by hand, um, all the processes are similar with just slight variations depending on where you're applying them. Yeah. Well, being located here in Burbank, a lot of the people that this is addressed to, we ultimately see here. We have a lot of our clients that are uh, in the industry and uh, they're used to sculpting and it's just a matter of what do you do with the sculpt once you're done with it. And in fact, we've even used molds they've used for other processes and, and made a wax out of them. It's not always a perfect match, but it's a great way to get started with a piece and take it into, uh, into bronze if it's really important to you. Yeah, and uh, Stan made uh, bronze pieces of some of his artwork. We did. Uh, and uh, I believe this is the foundry that this he used. This is the foundry he used, yeah. It's been a number of years, but yes, we, we were doing his work here. This, this foundry's been here for 40 years. So many people in Southern California, especially this, this part of the valley, have been using us for, for many, many years. I'm just lucky to be the third owner of the place. But uh, it's got quite a, quite a legacy, quite a history, and you know we're doing work for some of the top contemporary artists today. Well, I mean, this whole process for me has been really exciting, and I'm really honored to, to be able to sculpt uh, a bust of Stan, you know, for the school, for his family, and uh, and then, you know, to top it all off, to use the same foundry that he used. There's something really great about that. It really brings it all together for, for me and for everybody, I'm sure. And uh, um, thank you so much for, for your help in that. You're very welcome. We're glad to be part of the process. Right. Thank you. You're welcome.